lies as a tattered shield because it's been dismantled by internal critique. We have a, peop we have a, a group of um, liberal individuals who had developed this particular norm, created really an ideal through which we could try and regulate power. And then it became such a useful critical tool that we began to train it upon ourselves and undermine its own, its own ethos. And of course, that played into the hands of some greedy populists who thought, great, we can now just undermine and take away the one tool that might hold us to account. And we can feed the masses with the agenda that human rights and politics somehow don't go and that human rights is some kind of an elite mechanism driven by a few. Well, if you listen to what our speakers have to say today and Elvira's book, many of those ideas are going to be challenged. This idea that there's some kind of a North-South debate, that somehow you know, the North liberal states are pushing the bounds of human rights and dragged back by African and Asian states who somehow don't want to participate. Well, the evidence doesn't show us that, as the book suggests. This idea that somehow there are, there are a number of people, experts, who can drive us forward and leave masses behind and not explain to them, the book doesn't really show us that. This idea that human rights may not have answers to society, the book doesn't show us that. And many more things. So what I want to do is welcome you today. I want you to participate in this. I want to start by getting the author of the book herself, Elvira Dominguez Redondo, to say a few words about it. Uh, I'm then going to hand over to two people who have served as special reporters and one who's in a current special procedure mandate to talk a little bit about their experience. Have Colin, who's working on these cases in India, tell you about how human rights is fundamental to, to work there and other people who might pop in and surprise Elvira even with what they might want to say about it. But it's going to be an interactive and hopefully a fun session. If you haven't got something to drink, uh, get it. Of course, I include water in that particular process because Josh Cooper at 6.30 in the morning, I, I imagine anything else stronger is probably not fair. But without further ado, Elvira, over to you. You're on mute. That has to be said at least once in a Zoom call. Okay, I'm not mute any longer. Um, first of all, thank you everybody who is attending. I don't I seem to have a view of who is attending. I saw the list before and I saw many colleagues and friends who have been there for me in my professional journey and I'm very grateful you're here and also very grateful to everybody new who I don't know and I hope we get to know each other at some point and you will get to know a bit more about me at least, which I don't know if it's great. Um, the three announced panelists, I also want to thank them particularly before starting, um, Soledad García Muñoz, Magdalena Sepúlveda Carmona and Jose Antonio Guevara, and a non-announced speaker that I guess is a very nice surprise that has just disappeared the screen, Colin Gonzalez. Um, all of them have been an inspiration throughout my research and throughout my whole professional academic life. All of them are also uh, illustrative of the kind of characteristics that can be combined in some exceptional human beings. They have all worked uh, with grassroots movements at local, national, regional, and international level. They have got their own academic credentials and they have trained many other human rights lawyers. Um, and in the context of today's seminar, they bring their own experience as a special rapporteurs of the United Nations and the Organization of American States. And of course, calling now to his own experience on managing a an NGO and his engagement with these procedures from this perspective. Unfortunately, um, due to a last minute commitment that I think has a lot to do with politics, um, Soledad García Muñoz couldn't attend right now. She's locked in another meeting. Nonetheless, she still managed to record a video that will be played later on. I will say very little about my book. You have to buy it and read it all. Um, but uh, I, I will say at least what made me write it and what are my conclusions so far. Um, since I started my academic career as an international lawyer, as, as someone who has a very classic 
formal training as a lawyer in Roman law, when I approached special procedures for the first time, somewhere in 1996, I think, um, I was immediately shocked by the fact that these human rights mechanisms that were at the time not very well known, despite being three decades in existence, they had developed methods of work that were very intrusive of state sovereignty. And the only reason they could do this is because their creation depended on a political decision. They didn't have the straight jacket of other legal decisions, and therefore they were dependent on this ad hoc political consensus that gave them great freedom to act in a way that other human rights mechanisms couldn't do. Um, I always like to remind everybody that they are called special, not because they are exceptionally great, but because they are temporary. They can disappear any moment. And that's the meaning in the United Nations of a special. A special committee, a special rapporteur, a special anything means it's temporary. So they were built and created on purpose as a fragile mechanism, the bone of political negotiations that could disappear any moment. That's still the case today. They didn't have a coherent institutional support, although that they do have now, at least to a certain extent. And nonetheless, they could implement pretty much all the promotional and protectional um, functions that had been adjudicated or that had been associated with human rights, international human rights mechanism. So that always made me wonder, what, is it that bad that states are so closely linked to human rights mechanisms? Are they really linked or are they actually detached? Um, what, what is the role of states in the development of these mechanisms? Because everything you read, and the first thing I read, I can remember today, um, I will always remember, is a book by Olivier de Fouville in French on special procedures in, published in 1996. You got this impression that the good thing about special procedures was that they were more and more legalized. Um, and I have tested that hypothesis basically on the book. And while I was doing that, many other ones also fall apart. Special procedures have been linked to the political decisions of a body called the Commission on Human Rights First and the Human Rights Council now. And while every time this body increased or changed or got reformed, there's been always a fear that this will lead to detrimental impacts on human rights, mainly because all these reforms have always been accompanied by a bigger representation of Asian, African, and Latin American countries. The truth is that this has never happened and that many advances in the human rights agenda from the abolition to apartheid to advances in economic, social, and cultural rights have been totally linked to the increase of Asian, African, and Latin American states in the agenda. And nowadays, I'm not even sure this is true anymore because there's less and less unified agendas that correspond with regions. So it is very difficult to do, but I think we must do it. When we look, and we have more and more tools to do this, but when we look at how states vote and how states react to human rights agenda, there's no clear divisions north, south. There's no clear divisions east, west. This, these easy categories don't fit what is really happening. And I think we need to understand them better because we are, at the moment, we really need leaders to bring the human rights agenda forward. And as far as we portray this agenda as some kind of Western agenda, particularly at the moment when there's no leaders as such in the West uh, willing to take ownership over human rights issues, then the agenda might disappear if nobody else feels ownership. 
So if you portray some states as disengaged, as being always the same state, they will never, they will never own human rights uh, agendas. So I think, I hope, I have portrayed how different states have contributed through the process, how the Human Rights Council as an intergovernmental uh, body has also evolved in a way that has reinforced special procedures over time. And finally, I have also tried to portray the political agenda, if you want, of the independence of the experts and how these experts that don't trust states and states that don't trust experts and have to find a balance on how to monitor each other and allow each other's survival, how they are also constrained by their own institutional position and the fact that this has been a kind of mechanism that has been mainly in the hands. When we talk about experts, we are talking about mainly academics in law, not all kinds of experts and not all kinds of regulations. So I, I have tried to also analyze how they operate without being part of the United Nations structure, but under the blue stamp of the United Nations. They have a weight in the United Nations. They are, you want, uh, representatives of the United Nations when they interact with the states, when they interact with other stakeholders. However, they are not part of the United Nations and they put them in a very special position that has created obstacles, but also many opportunities. I'm going to leave it here. I'm more than happy to answer questions later. And thank you, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Elvira, for that um, opening uh, statement that just sets out what it is the book is going to do and tries to do. Um, we have three speakers now, and I haven't introduced them yet because I wanted to do it at this particular point in time. Um, Elvira mentioned them already. The first to go is going to be Magdalena Sepulveda Carmona. Uh, Magdalena, you may know from her, her very early work on uh, economic and social rights and questions of justiciability of economic and social and cultural rights. You may also know her from her special rapporteurship, which she did a fantastic job on extreme poverty. But Magdalena is today at the cutting edge of questions around economic, social and cultural rights. She heads up the global initiative on ESC rights and is really trying to look at a whole range of questions that really human rights lawyers about a decade ago hadn't even thought of about accountability in tax law, about the extent to which you can understand how forensic accounting can be brought to pay in accountability. Magdalena, it's great to have you on this and would you please reflect on the book? Of course, you've known Elvira for a long time as well and has been very much part of her journey. But in, in your comments also, please do give us any insights on really what have special rapporteurs contributed perhaps? Maybe if, is this North-South divide any meaning? And politics, the politicization of human rights, can it be a force for good? Over to you, Magdalena. Thank you very much, Joshua. And as a disclosure, but I think that it was already evident from Elvira's remark, we are very good friends. However, people who doesn't know us don't know that actually we also like to have heated discussion on different things. So you cannot take for granted that I could uh, agree with the thesis of the book. However, I did. I fully agree with the thesis of the book. I think that uh, I agree with Elvira in the fact that politicization is at the root of the most remarkable contributions that the special procedures have done, uh, including their development of very pioneer method of, of work. Uh, I, I do believe actually that if uh, the special procedures system is, uh, have been considered the jewel of the crown, as uh, once Kofi Annan put it, it has been exactly because these mandate holders have been able to negotiate within the political space available in order to strengthen human rights. I believe that uh, Elvira's thesis or El Elvira's book has been able to articulate um, the, um, the view, the position or even the feeling of many former and current mandate holders as well as many other who knows the system well um, but it has been only through the encyclopedic knowledge that Elvira has on the special procedure system 
and uh, the academic rigor that she has made this evident and, and put it forward the idea of politicization and, and, and the benefit it has provided. There are several aspects of the books or, or, or points made in the books that I would like to highlight, um, but I will restrict to two. One is uh, Elvira's point in the book that special procedures have uh, taken advantages of their vague political mandate to implement practices that would have, uh, needed, would have need, needed years of negotiation uh, with uncertain outcomes if they have to be established in a legal or quasi-legal document. I fully agree with this. Uh, I think that this is exactly the case. In my own experience as uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights uh, for 2008 to 2014, I saw that in, in many two areas of work. One was the contribution to the normative development of norms and the handling of communication. And I'm going to briefly refer to both trying to answer uh, Joshua's question about my, my own experience. Um, on the contribution of the normative development, I had the privilege to lead the process for the adoption of the UN Guiding Principles on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. And these were an extremely uh, political uh, process, actually. It was one of the few documents that was first prepared by the former Subcommission of Human Rights. Um, it, it started the process actually in 2001. Um, the subcommission was requested by the commission to do these guidelines on poverty and human rights. And it, one, it, it was one of the few um, instrument or draft instrument that passed from the sub, from the, for the former commission to the newly established Human Rights Council in 2006. Um, I would say that the, the draft prepared by the subcommission wasn't um, extremely technical. Um, but with this draft guiding principle, somehow it was the same problem with that we saw with the draft norm, the draft of norms and responsibility of transnational cooperation. It was a hot potato. Uh, the the council didn't know what to do with this uh, with this uh, draft in with both of those drafts, and and I'm referring here to the extreme poverty draft. What happened was that the only solution that they found was to have a resolution passing the responsibility to me. There were several, as a special rapporteur, and at that moment, independent expert on extreme poverty and human rights. And the change of name is another topic that Elvira addressed in the, in the book that is extremely important. What are these independent experts, special rapporteur, et cetera. But uh, with, after several resolutions of the council, and several drafts that I needed to submit to the council, I was able to um, draft these norms. Uh, the content of the guiding principles are extremely progressive, at least for that time, and it was an extremely political process. Um, I can give details afterwards, but one of, the, one of the factors that I think that it was crucial for their final adoption uh, by consensus by the council at the time and the US who uh, a country that always been against ESC rights actually voted in favor of uh, the, the guiding principles and then it, they were endorsed by the General Assembly um, was the fact that I, I, at that moment I was living in, in Geneva and I was able actually to meet with the different regional groups that they have regular meetings uh, and these are groups that the ambassadors of each group have in, on a regular basis. And I sold them these principles. And if you were to see me as my colleagues that went to me to the different meetings, it was that I was selling a completely different document to the African group or to the Latin American group or to the European and Western group. And this was because I knew that they did have very little time to read, it, to read the whole draft. Uh, and so I sell to them what I thought it was the point that they will uh, have it. Uh, also, and very briefly on the handling of communication, uh, the mandate of uh, extreme poverty started two mandates before me uh, as independent expert. Um, and with this, as Elvira's book uh, rightly point out, although there seems 
that in theory should be no difference between the name. In practice, there are difference. And generally, to independent expert, uh, there is giving the task that are really considered not fully fleshed human rights violations. And that this has the consequence regarding the method of work. So in principles, independent expert were not uh, considered, although this is, this is not in written, well, it's in written in the resolution. The resolution that creates this mandate doesn't give them the, um, the competency to handle communication. Um, and I started handling communication with this mandate and that was contested at the beginning. And it was not less contested also by OHCHR providing support because this has not been done before by other mandate, uh, but it wasn't contested by state. The state started answering the request of information that um, a special procedure sent as a letter of allegation and therefore the system kind of um, established. And within that system, also I have the opportunity to, uh, together with at that, the, the, at that time, the special rapporteur on foot, Olivia de Schutter, lead a process of, um, that it was very pioneer actually. And, um, and this is very briefly, uh, again, we had the opportunity to receive information that it was documented by, very well documented by NGOs and an academic clinic of uh, a university about the violation of rights that the, uh, so the South Korean company POSCO was doing in, um, in India. So what we did, uh, and again, it was a pioneer at the time, is that we sent three letter of allegation. Um, we sent a letter, a letter of allegation to uh, South Korea, where the headquarters of the organization was based. We sent another, at the same time, another letter of allegation to India where the violation had occurred. But we also sent a letter of allegation to POSCO, the company. Um, and we did this, of course, we didn't use the language of violations of rights. What we did, we used the guiding principles on business and human rights. And we used a different language, but we sent this letter to the company. And I have to say that this was extremely successful a few months later, actually, we have the representative of uh, POSCO India, the representative of uh, POSCO South Korea, uh, and also the um, uh, consultant of this big uh, accounting firm that POSCO has hired to write their, uh, their social accountability um, uh, principles for the company discussing with us in, in Geneva. So, and I think that this was also uh, resisted by the system somehow because it was a lot of questions at that time of why we'll, we will send a letter to the company if that wasn't kind of in our mandate, but it was extremely uh, successful. Um, I have to say, in order to finalize, that I also agree with Elvira's uh, conclusions or uh, her final observations in the book. Um, I think that there are positive development in the fact that this mandate can use uh, their political space available, but there are also risks. There is, um, the system is unpredicted. Um, a misguided decision of one, one of the experts from the system might well undermine the system as a whole or the work of other colleagues. Uh, there is a need to eliminate some weaknesses and ensure transparency in order to ensure for victims in particular that, that they have access to this system. Um, and just to conclude, I, I do believe that this book should be made um, a compulsory reading for all new uh, mandate holders and, and maybe also for some staff of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that support this mandate and it should be in, uh, in any uh, induction package of all new mandate holders. Thank you very much. Thank you for those words, Magda, and for sharing your experience. And of course, we do have uh, participants here from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So there you have it. There's the, the plea, but also to the various legal academics. And I see many, many, many friends among the list and really sterling characters of people who have 
taught human rights, maybe that's something you want to, to, to consider. Our next speaker is Jose Guevara Bermudez. You may know him as a noted Mexican writer on human rights issues. You may know him as a leading uh, contender for the push for the International Criminal Court. You may know him from the university work that he's done. You may know him from his current role on the Committee for Arbitrary Detention, but you also must know that he is at the cutting edge today of defending Mexican human rights at, in conditions that are far from ideal. Jose, you also have been particip uh, uh, participant to this journey that Elvira has, uh, has undertaken and uh, we'd love to, to hear from you. And also, of course, I'm privileged enough to say that Jose is a member of the Council of Minority Rights Group International as well. So please, over to you. Thank you very much, Joshua. And uh, first of all, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to, to Elvira and to Middlesex University for organizing this webinar, but for inviting me to participate. In and, and, and I have to say this, but I'm still a member for the following month of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. So whatever I say is in my personal capacity and, and it doesn't uh, compromise at all the, the, the position of, of, of the group. Uh, I also would like to add some personal uh, notes of at Elvira. All the years I have been learning for, from from her. Uh, first, uh, during our times at the at the PhD at the University Carlos III, well, she was the most brilliant student from 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 the group. And I'm sorry, Magdalena. Uh, sorry, Soledad as well. But Elvira was the brightest of all. Uh, and uh, and she of course influenced um, uh, my interest uh, in, in the United Nations machinery. Uh, also, uh, she has been very very generous for all these years of work on human rights issues in Mexico. While I was at my uh, uh, mother university, uh, Iberoamericana, she always was keen to participate in our activities, and uh, she came to Mexico for trainings uh, within the university. <laughs> And most recently in my work as a human rights director of an NGO called Comisión Mexicana uh, por la Defensa y Promoción de los Derechos Humanos, which I'm no longer the executive director of since two days ago. Uh, she was very kind to accept and visit Mexico and, and she did a fantastic work in a fact-finding mission for the situation of the human rights defenders in, in the country a couple of years ago. So. Uh, I just want to, to, to profit from this opportunity to thank Elvira for so many years of kindness, of friendship, and for sharing her wisdom uh, with me and, of course, with everyone, uh, because this book, uh, uh, this book, in my view, is, uh, is, is one of the most, or if not the most, and sorry for the superlative, uh, for the use of the superlative, uh, comprehensive and updated analysis of the origins, legal nature, function, setbacks, challenges of the UN special procedures system. Uh, for that reason, I would like to um, acknowledge that, 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 that the book uh, evidences how closely Elvira follows the details uh, of the work of the, of the special procedures of individual special procedures, but that the system and even uh, of those uh, mechanisms uh, of the system of special procedures that do not produce a lot of information about the way they work, like, like the coordinating committee, but she's more, very familiar of, of the way that this, uh, this body uh, works uh, and, and the book uh, shows it in, in a very, very clear manner. So um, uh, I, I, I want to highlight that as, a, as, a, as an important element, but, but also I would like that, that uh, recognize that, that this uh, close follow-up of, of the way that mandate holders and, and the mandates perform their duties uh, is also an expression of a, an additional layer of, a, of accountability for, for the system. Uh, as, as, as member of the system, uh, we know that we are accountable to the UN, to the Human Rights Council, to the General Assembly. We're accountable before civil society. Uh, we're accountable to victims, uh, to practitioners, uh, to affected communities or group that that come to to ask us to do things uh, in their favor, we're accountable. We're accountable uh, on, in, in front of governments. Uh, but with this book, uh, I have I feel very accountable to 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 the, acad to the academics, and I feel very accountable to scholars that are analyzing if we work in a consistent manner, 
and if we are implementing our mandates in, our, in accordance with the resolutions that create the mandates, but also in accordance with the manuals and code of conduct, and the manuals and the code of conduct of special procedures. So this is a very interesting uh, book that make, make the system uh, clear for, for, for who is interested in, in, in learning from how it works, but also uh, it's, it's, it's a mechanism of accountability for, for the, for the for the system of special procedures. So, uh, in my experience, um, the the uh, as, as, as the book says, the, the use of politicization is related um, um, to, to to more to how the before the Human Rights Commission, now the Human Rights Council deals with particular uh, situations. And uh, the criticism and the, and, the, and the change from the Commission to the Council, uh, governments and civil society use that word to justify the change of the system uh, of the Commission to the, to the Council. And, uh, and, and I really like uh, one of the conclusions of the first chapter of the book that says that, uh, that while some countries may escape scrutiny, the situations under consideration not solely are not solely politically motivated, but are based on reported and verified facts. Therefore, nor, not every situation of human rights violations that deserve international scrutiny is under the radar of the Human Rights Council, but all those that are warranted. We thought, because I was involved as diplomat and member of the foreign service in those times in Mexico, that the UPR was supposed to be the mechanism, the avenue to identify with the same methodology um, and under the same legal basis, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the uh, treaties that were ratified by the country, under the same type of uh, the reports that uh, are the basis of the, of the UPR, the reports produced by the government, the one of the, what the system has produced in, 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 with regards to the, a given country or, or those uh, 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 reports uh, that were used to produce the report from NGOs or national human rights institutions. And uh, we thought that the UPR was supposed to be the mechanism to, to identify which countries deserve the attention of the country, uh, the, the attention of the council. But unfortunately, such UPR did not happen and is not being used for those purposes. We still depend on the political will or the political uh, assessment from uh, region, regional groups or countries to decide which country is going to be under the attention of the of the of the group and uh, of the of the council and they uh, uh, sponsor a resolution or they call for a special session that then adopts a resolution that creates uh, a, a fact finding mission or a, or a special procedure for a given country so unfortunately the, the change from the commission to the council as the book says did not change that politics around the creation or the scrutiny of, of countries under, under the scope of the, of the, of the Council. But uh, the UPR helped in, in a given uh, manner to, to identify issues related to given countries, not to call the attention of the country, but the work from, from local NGOs. Uh, I also agree with the book and with Elvira that the code of conduct of special, of special procedure was more a positive thing than a negative thing. Uh, it's, a, it's an instrument that strengthened and consolidated uh, the working methods and practice of special procedures rather than limit its functions. And it also gave special uh, procedures mandate holders the parameters to deal uh, with issues that in occasions we have to recognize uh, mandate holders are not familiar with uh, or lack of experience, like for example, the use of mass media or the, loose, or the use right now in this new context of social media. So uh, as Elvira says, a mistake uh, from a mandate holder in this regard, which is very sensitive for, for the polit politics around the, the, the performance of the tasks of the mandate holders, uh, a mistake of one member can be the mistake for the whole system. So we have to be careful. And I think that the code of conduct gives us gives the mandate holders guidance and clarity on how we should behave with the, with information for being objective and for the use of 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 of, of, of media um, and it also helps to restrain governments that would like to attack uh, special procedures for any conduct that they consider inappropriate because they have the code of conduct 
and it's very difficult that they can uh, just include whatever uh, whatever conduct that is not related to that conduct product. So I think that the that the that the that the code of conduct what was also a positive thing rather than a negative thing for the performance of the of the task of the group. I also would like to clarify clarify that one of the aspects that was mentioned from the working group. The working group has a policy, at least in the last six years that I have been a member, uh, not to use the media uh, once we issue opinions. We issue around uh, 60 or to 90 opinions a year. So normally the group does not. Uh, 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 issue an a, a press release related to each one of the opinions, nor selectively to, to the opinions. Uh, we only react when governments attack opinions or attack the mandate of the working group, and then we accept to give interviews when we are requested to do so. So Elvira mentions a case that is in which the UK is involved and, and a member of the working group or two members of the working group participated in interviews because it was first the government of the, of, of, of the UK that started to misguide public opinions and started to say things about the members and the working group itself. So it, uh, it deserved the attention of the group to clarify those issues and that's why we responded. Of course, there are other, uh, and, and, and most recently we did the same with Spain, with a case in which Spain was, was, was involved. We did not issue a press statement, we did not ask the media to, to participate in interviews, but when Spain started to criticize the group, uh, started to pose questions about the objectivity of the group and the independence of its members, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then we went out to clarify issues that were needed to clarify. Uh, other press statements could be issued. Uh, by by the by the working group, but they are more related to urgent appeals, or they are related when we are advised or um, required by sources uh, or even governments uh, that a statement, a press release, could be instrumental for the for the implementation of the opinions. So uh, in in certain occasions we do it, but we do not we do not do it uh, normally. Uh, or systematically with all cases, all, all orient appeals, or uh, uh, for the implement implementation of all, all opinions, it is uh, in, a, in a case by case basis when it is requested by any kind of stakeholders. Uh, how much time do we have, Josh? A couple of minutes more, Jose. Okay, I just want to, to make another uh, an additional uh, reflection on another uh, topic that I think it is very, very, very very uh, uh, important. Um, uh, uh, the issue of country visits. Uh, I think that there is a lot of a lot of of, of, of room for 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 improvement for for how the uh, system uh, produces country visits or make the country visits. Uh, the book says that uh, each mandate holder is inventing the wheel when they uh, perform a country visit, and, and I think it's true. Uh, each mandate holder arrives to, to assume its functions and decide, okay, I'm going to visit this country. The way that it is decided, in my view, uh, at least in my experience, uh, has uh, two main elements. Uh, one is that uh, once we receive sufficient information of a given uh, situation that requires the attention of the working group to visit the country, it could be a crackdown against human rights defenders, it could be uh, a systematic detention of, uh, of, of opposition uh, leaders or, or the opposition or journalists or, the, or a situation of the, the systematic detention of migrants with, with, without respect of, of international standards and so on. So first, that we have, we receive information that it could come from NGOs, uh, from uh, uh, international organizations, uh, from uh, the cases that we deal with through the opinions, urgent appeals, or, or allegation letters. So uh, the information is there. And then the second most important element, I think, is that the government decides that they want to invite the working group and uh, uh, or decides to invite the, 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 the mandate. So it's very difficult to say that it's a selective approach by mandate holders or to decide what country to visit because we are always depending on the willingness of the country to accept the visit. And it's not related to the 122 standing invitations because those are just a formality. In practice, you need the real invitation from the government and for that invitation to happen, 
then you need uh, either internal politics to put pressure to the government because they're probably in a, in a political transition. Probably they need uh, the visit to advance an agenda that internal politics, they do not allow it. So internal issues could uh, be the justification for the visit or international pressure or cooperation that includes country visits again in political transitions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, but what 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 I really think that there is a, a need for for improvement is in the methodology of what we do, and the collective the collective the collection of data, and uh, the product the production of files within the UN system. We go there. We uh, uh, interview victims of, of detention. I mean, 160 each member. Normally, we visit. Uh, three members so there's a large amount of information we have a standard questionnaire that we some use some others don't use and that information in, in, in notebooks and when we leave the country that information is lost so that information could be used for the future to follow up on the cases to follow up on the information that we collect on, on the practices of detention and where are the, the the failures of the system in which people are detained. So uh, we are uh, uh, do, doing country visits as fast as we're done during the, the, the League of Nations. I recently uh, read a book a couple of years ago from Susan Pedersen named The Guardians, The League of Nations and the Crisis of Empire. And she describes the way that uh, the, 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 the fact, the fact find me, the fact findings from the from the mandates commission was was done and it was exactly the same five persons that were considered experts from government or whatever were sent to the south pacific or were sent to to the middle east to collect information they interviewed government officials persons affected by in the in the, the, the empires then or the or the other system of, of, of mandates and then um, uh, they came back to geneva wrote the reports presented to the system of the league of nations and then all the information normally from notes uh, were were not kept uh, in a systematic manner and now we have the technology to do it we could all use the information and put it in databases and then could be useful for future visits from other mandate holders or the follow-up visits from the same uh, mandate holders. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I, I had like another three or four topics that I would like to discuss. Uh, I, I just want to continue with, with this. I think that the book is a fantastic opportunity to engage in, in, uh, in, in, in these issues. Uh, and I would like just to congratulate again Elvira for, for the fantastic work that you have done uh, with, with, with this with this book and for um, and of course of, of your previous uh, publications uh, related to to the UN minorities and so on. Thank you very much again for inviting. Fantastic, Jose. Thank you very much. And of course, the reflection is also based. I I realized as you were speaking that you were at, you were in Geneva when that transition happened from the Commission to the Council, and you played quite a significant role. So those insights are, are fabulous. Colleagues, you may feel that this is all about the book itself. And actually, there's room also for personal narratives on this one. So it's just that we've got these colleagues here who are so excited by the theme and what this what this means for the uh, for the development of our field. Uh, the next message is a very short one. It's about five minutes. So do bear with us. It's from Soledad Garcia Munoz, another person who's a, a, a fellow a journey journey woman on this one, really, and really has been a leading activist on, on gender in her role as Amnesty International prior to this role. So Christiana, do you mind playing that, that video that Soledad um, recorded? One of the difficulties, of course, of having a current mandate is that you get called to other things. So over to Soledad. Good morning, everyone. I am Soledad Garcia Muñoz, a special reporter on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights, Redesca by its acronym in Spanish, of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. The Redesca is the second special reportership created three years ago by the Commission in order to support its mission to promote and protect all human rights for all people in the Americas. Unfortunately, I will not be able to participate in the webinar as I want so much. So I want to be present 
at least through these little message and, and remarks. First of all, of course, to congratulate the author, Dr. Elvira Dominguez Redondo, for her new and very important work in defense of politicization of human rights. A very special greeting to her, as well as to the incredible panel moderated by Professor Castellino and with comments from Dr. Sepulveda Carmona and Dr. Guevara Bermudez. To me, it is an honor and a privilege to be here, even virtually. As Dr. Dominguez Redondo wrote, the relevance of this work lies in the fact that this book constitutes the first comprehensive study of the UN Special Procedures as a system. Secondly, the work offers a provocative and necessary reflection on the role of politics and diplomacy in relation to special public procedures on the Human Rights Council. The author understands politicization as the application of double standards that undermine the essence of the rule of law. And similarly, it is inevitable. According to her, politicization is at the root of the most remarkable contribution of special procedures, including the development of pioneering methods of monitoring the behavior of states and the emergence of international standards with the state's endorsement. In third place, her contribution to the development of arguments helpful to answering criticism about the Western and neo-colonial character of human rights is also remarkable. As he said, it is imperative to empirically analyze and contest this criticism before they take further root, particularly since these critiques are based on widespread presumptions of policies and institutions that this book seeks to highlight as ill-funded. In times of so much uncertainty for humanity, and in which it often seems that the time of uh, multilateralism and the human rights agenda to be going through an unprecedented crisis, Professor Dominguez Redondo's book brings new tools to think outside the box. So, muchas gracias, Elvira. I really hope that this book guides new reflections and practices for the benefit of human rights, as well as their effective protection from the universal system. Being an organ of a different nature, the Commission and its mandates, like the Inter-American system as a whole, also experienced the so-called politicization in numerous aspects. And it will be really important for the system too, to have a similar work and reflection of, of this magnitude and, and depth. So this is, it is an invitation, Elvira, for a, a, next, a next book. Finally, uh, I would like to, to recommend, fully recommend reading this fantastic book to the global human rights community. And, and I hope to have also the, the translation in Spanish very soon, because it is a big asset for, for the, the academy as well for the human rights practitioner. And finally, just to say thank you, muchas gracias, Elvira, enhorabuena eh, de corazón. I am really proud of you and, and of, your, of your work. And please have a wonderful webinar. Bye-bye. Ciao. That was Soledad Garcia Munoz, and we will thank her again for those wonderful words. Now, Colin, you've been listening very patiently to this wonderful panel discussion, looking at the intricacies of international human rights law. And you and I have had lots of conversations about the use of it and how, how effective it might be in battles uh, in places like India. I mean, you know, you've got a, a practice of what, five, 600 cases, your Right Livelihood Award, the alternative Nobel Prize for the work that you did on the right to food. You're putting these principles into practice every day. You predicted the Kal Yug, uh, for those who don't understand Sanskrit or Hindi, that the dark, the dark times in India a long time ago. And you've seen 
their human rights lobby, in a sense, also turn on itself and undermine its own credentials. What's your reflection on this, if you don't mind sharing with us, please? You need to unmute as well, Colin. I trust you can hear us. Oh, we lost Colin. No. The internet, the, the digital divide, colleagues. This is known as the di digital divide, where we have essentially this, this problem regularly. But there's a number of other people who I want to call on while, while, Colin, while Colin hopefully rejoins us. Um, the newly, the newly um, this Colin might be coming back. Colin, can you hear us now? Colin, can you hear us? He's been waiting very patiently to speak to us colleagues and it's very late in India, but it seems that the connection isn't working. Let me try and unmute him. Colin, can you hear us? No. Uh, Christiana, can we, can we just go Can you hear ah, me? Perfect. Yes, we can. Please, over to you. Can you hear me? Yes, Colin. I can hear you, yes, but can you hear me? Yes. We can. Okay. Uh, Elvira, I'm so, so happy to see your book. I spoke to Joshua this morning and by the afternoon, I had your book printed and on my table. Congratulations, it's a very fine piece of work. And uh, I can't, I, I'm so happy for you. I really, you know, uh, you may remember that I turned to you many times uh, for clarifications on the complications in the, in the United Nations system, you know. We in India don't get a chance and my young lord Keep going, Colin. Um, Colin, there's can a you hear me? Colin, I'm so I try, sorry for this. I might try and get you on a WhatsApp yeah. call and you speak through my phone, will I? Apologies for this, colleagues, but it's probably worth listening to what Colin has to say, so bear with me. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can, but you're breaking up from time to time, and that's me ringing you on a WhatsApp call. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Go for it. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm breaking up. All right. Okay. Hey, Colin. Can you hear okay. me? I'm going to, I'm going to put my mic. Right, sure. Uh, remember that I turned to you when the switch took over from the Human Rights Commission to the Human Rights Council and we in India were quite uh, unclear as to what the changes were going to be. And then again recently on the UPR system where India promised uh, the UN that they would uh, ratify the convention against torture about six times and once they even gave a voluntary pledge to ratify the convention, and never did. They got the place on the, on the Human Rights Council, but uh, the UN didn't get their ratification of the Convention Against Torture. So thank you for all the, all, all the help over the years, all the love and affection, and I'm so happy to be here at the release of your book. I heard Joshua say at the beginning that human rights lies in tatters. And I know that there are some professors and some academics who've written uh, books on how they can they think human rights is in decline. But if they were to come to India or even Nepal or Pakistan, they would find that human rights is the core of our being. And human rights is the very basis on which we resist tyranny in our countries. As you know, India is moving towards fascism and the human rights movement is, uh, is very, very vibrant. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Perfectly, Colin, perfectly. Yeah, please. Okay. And the human rights movement is very, very vibrant. And it is the very soul 
of our resistance against tyranny. So I think this north-south uh, divide or artificial uh, sort of uh, differences uh, constructed on the basis of a north-south divide doesn't really make sense to people uh, in India. We use our constitutional law system very aggressively and perhaps we turn to the UN much less than countries in the developed world. And that is because our constitutional law systems are very robust and we can get from our courts orders that you, you could never possibly get in the, the developed uh, in the developed world so human rights activism is, is alive and kicking uh, even in the period of covid where you would expect people to retreat there has been no retreat on human rights in india and we are happily going ahead regardless of the dangers ahead and the problems associated with covid thank you for calling me here joshua and you gave me a wonderful chance to see my dear, dear friend and leader again congratulations once again Elvira. thank you very much colin and i think it's it's late enough but if you can rejoin the call please do but please don't don't feel compelled to do so it's a it's a pleasure and honor to have you here thank you very much cheers uh, another person that i'd like to call on now is is inga winkler Inga is at columbia and doing some incredible work herself and of course well, the part of this book was actually written at Columbia University when Elvira was on sabbatical. So Inga, please, if you could maybe share a few thoughts. Well, thanks so much. Uh, great to see all of you. Congratulations, uh, Elvira, on, on getting this done. I mean, it's an amazing um, achievement. I remember the, the early stages of, of the book while, while you were working on it at Columbia when you were there. And uh, well, on a personal note, I felt that we were very compatible in how we approached our work with long, long hours of working and then continuing that discussion over dinner and a glass of wine or two. And I really enjoyed having you, having you there. So I hope we can make that happen again at some point. And uh, well, the book, I haven't read the whole book yet, I have to admit, but from, from what I have read, I mean, it's amazing and it's great to see it come to, to fruition. And what I really value about it, it's the, it's the recognition that these, these mechanisms, these special procedures, that they are political. Um, and the way the book puts that into context. I mean, my students, everyone else asks me so often, so what are these special rapporteurs? What are special procedures? And it's so difficult to explain that, uh, but you actually manage. So I really appreciate that. Um, and the second aspect that I find so fascinating is how you manage to present the, the special procedures as a system. I think all so often we focus on, on one particular mandate or maybe a set of mandates, but really understanding how they work as a system and how they could better work as a system. Um, I think that's so, so important in particular when we have more and more mandates added to that system. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for, for doing all this work. Um, congratulations on the book. Uh, I really like the way it looks inside and outside. And I already, I'm teaching a course on UN Human Rights Bodies this fall and I already assigned a good chunk of it to my students. So we'll have more people who learn about the system. Congratulations. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Inga. And thanks for also stepping out of your orientation, student orientation to do this. So really appreciate oh, it. Oh, that was my pleasure. This is so much more interesting. <laughs> uh, we have the newly crowned director of the Posner Center at uh, University of Chicago, uh, Kathleen Kavanagh, a dear friend, and uh, again, another person who's accompanied this journey and been very significant. Kathleen. <laughs> So firstly, it's nice to virtually meet all of you. Elvira, I'm really sorry we're not doing this in person. It would be great to be able to share uh, with all of your colleagues. I'm gonna say two words um, or two things about, first about the product and then about the person. I'm the only one seemingly who doesn't have a copy of your book. So that is a very um, big hint to put it in the post to me. But I have had the pleasure of Elvira speaking about her book a number of times when she's um, given lectures in our LLM course formerly when I was at the Irish Center for Human Rights. And so I know the underpinning and the premise. 
And as a sociolegal scholar, one of the arguments that we have very often with those who approach law and human rights in a doctrinal way is that law and politics are synonymous. And so it's very refreshing to see someone approach the idea of politics and law, not from an, um, a point that law is neutral and it must be an arbiter, that actually politics can play a beneficial role um, in how we understand human rights and how the human rights project gets realized. So I'm very much looking forward to reading the book when it arrives. Um, but I also, and I think take the opportunity, because I've known Elvira for over 20 years now, to talk about a little bit about the person. Because I think within an academic landscape, one of the things I've come to really appreciate about not only her, but her work, is one of the essential criteria, I think, of being an outstanding academic. And that is that you operate with integrity not just integrity of how you approach your colleagues and how you work in an academic environment, but how you approach the work. And so I have absolutely no doubt that the work was and is empirically rigorous, um, that it will be disrupting. And that's another part of a really good contribution, that it will disrupt some of the language and some of the narrative that has come to occupy the space. So, Alvira, many congratulations. I look forward to seeing you on this side of the sea um, at some point very, uh, very soon. And uh, yeah, Mabruk. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And on your own incredible journey now in, in, in a new place in, in Chicago, we had to train and make sure that, you know, Kathleen's experience in Europe is brought to bear in a place where it's most needed at the moment in the world of human rights. So great for that. Thank you for that. Phil. Again, your work and on the European Court of Human Rights has been incredible, incredible in inspiring so many. Please, over to you. Well, thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Elvira. And many congratulations from, from me, Elvira. But Kathleen, like, like you, I also haven't had the pleasure of reading your book yet, but I know I'd agree with every word. There's no, no question about that. What, 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 could I, uh, what could I say about the politic polit politicization of human rights? Um, you started, Elvira, by talking about your training as a lawyer. I, too, am a sort of dyed-in-the-wool, unreconstructed lawyer, but I would be the first to say that uh, politicization of human rights is, I think, inevitable. It's what we have. It's what we've already, always had, I would say, in different ways. And very much, I think, I've come to see uh, the, the human rights systems as a, as a sort of mutually, when they work, anyway, a mutually reinforcing uh, body of, of, of legal and political and other systems at the supranational level and, and at the national level and you know, we have to we have to engage with that uh, as, as best we can and I think if when you're talking about the regional human rights mechanisms I, I do think you can you can say that they work through a combination of, of the legal and the political no, no more so than in in the in Europe where I think perhaps, arguably, maybe uh, we have the most, you know, the, the sort of strongest combination of, of, of the legal and the political. We've seen um, interesting developments in, in very recently in the European system of, of states starting to use the interstate process much more. Um, I mean, that partly reflects uh, 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 you know, the situation of conflict in, in the East, but, but also we've had just in the last two months, we've had two new interstate cases from the Netherlands, from Liechtenstein, and it must be, uh, as a counterpoint to what's going on in Trump's US, it must be a good thing, I think, to see states using uh, li these mechanisms as a way of, of trying to resolve conflicts uh, rather than using other methods. But in Europe, you've got the you know you've got the Committee of Ministers, which has had always had that treaty-based role of supervising the implementation of, of judgments. Um, so the, the political uh, politicization is is absolutely embedded in in the system, and you know one can be very critical of that process. It takes a long time. Uh, it's a peer of, can be a very weak peer review process, and so on. And yet there is an and yet. Uh, it, it, I think, um, does, when it works, it sort of creates that space for political dialogue that Magdalena, you were talking about. It allows, it does allow civil society 
in it allows national human rights institutes in to to, to engage in that process and and, and have some have, have some dialogue um, and I think one just to finish the example I'd mention of, of uh, that illustrates that is the situation of human rights defenders in Azerbaijan at the moment who have been um, incredibly under the cosh in the last sort of five or six years um, and the the committee of ministers has uh, proved prove resolute I think working with the court working uh, very closely with the court they're feeding on each other and we got to a situation just at the beginning of this year where the Committee of Ministers has uh, de really demanded the, the quashing of the convictions of the human rights defenders and that started to happen. We've had Ilga Mamadov and Russell Jafarov's uh, con convictions quashed in April uh, directly as a result of this process. It's been a long process but I think it illustrates uh, that, that we have the politicization and it, and it is a process that can, can work. Um, so um, Elvira, I look forward to reading the book when I, when I also finally get a copy like Kathleen, hint, hint. Uh, but many, many congratulations uh, again to you. And just to say what a, uh, just a pleasure and an honor it is to have you as a dear friend and as a dear colleague at Middlesex. Thank you. Brilliant, Phil. Thank you very much. Now, now you might think that this is all serious and Alethea, I know, wants to speak next. And she says, I'm, she's not an expert in this, in this area, which is, which is a little bit disingenuous because Alethea's record as an expert in law, I think, is, is well known. But Alethea, over to you. And uh, Iana puede hablar en español también, porque hay otras personas y Elvira también puede, yo creo, entender un poco de español. But Alethea, please, over to you first. Okay, thank you, Joshua. Um, Elvira, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy that the book uh, is out. And as uh, Kathleen and uh, Philip, I haven't, um, I haven't had the opportunity to read the book. I don't have it yet, but I'm looking forward to do it because, um, I mean, it seems for the, for the, because I know you and I, and I, I actually am a, a, I am a, a witness of the beginning of, the, of your academic career at the University of Carlos III. And I, and I witnessed uh, your enthusiasm uh, um, about human rights and about the special procedures. And, um, and now the book is there. I think that, I mean, from the discussion, I, um, I'm really, um, from this exciting discussion, I, 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 I see that there are many, uh, many points you made, very interesting. Um, probably the book is, is very provocative. And um, I would like to think that the politicization of, um, of uh, human rights is not only related to the involvement of states, but also uh, to the involvement of civil society. And um, I know that you think uh, the same and uh, that you agree with that. Um, I believe that this book is, is very important because it, 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 it it, 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 it explains uh, what the special procedures um, are. And um, yes, um, uh, I want uh, to congratulate you uh, because uh, I'm sure that this is a very, uh, ex an excellent piece of work and that um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading it to reading it, uh, Evira. This is what, what I can say. Uh, congratulations, and uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Ana, quiere hablar? Ana, Ana says that she's not an expert on the book, but she's a good friend of Elvira, and uh, it's just an opportunity para, para compartir una mensaje con Elvira, si quiere. Okay. Hola. Sí, podemos hablar, podemos uh, escuchar. ¿Me oyes? Perfecto. Yo suelo decir que mm, enhorabuena y más que nada por el maravilloso trabajo que hace ella continuamente en todo lo que se pone a hacer. O sea, todo lo que se propone y proyecta, eh, la verdad que tiene unos resultados estupendos. Yo del tema de derecho internacional siento decepcionaros a todos, no, no entiendo mucho, no entiendo 
por no decir no entiendo nada, pero eh, me gusta siempre saber eh, el trabajo que realiza tanto Joshua como, como Elvira. Reconozco que es una labor bastante intensa, dura, desagradecida, pero ellos ponen todo su empeño y creo que consiguen sacarlo todo adelante. Simplemente eso. Muchísimas felicidades por el libro y nada, espero mi ejemplar. Un beso muy fuerte para todos. Muchísimas gracias, Ana. Uh, the next person who wants to speak is another legend of human rights, William Shebas. Bill, over to you. Thank you, Joshua. Well, I'm trying to unmute and start the video. There we go. Uh, well, Elvira, of course, like Kathleen Kavanaugh and others, I've known her for many years, and we actually have an office next to one another. So she doesn't know this, but I often hear her conversations because the walls are very thin in the office. Um, people often, uh, uh, international lawyers, I think, often uh, grumble about the politics that's involved in human rights and in international criminal law and in the related fields. And they, they want to get some sort of pure um, legalistic approach that is, you know, sort of, you know, premised on what we've all learned in law school. And I always say that I, it's actually the politics of it that attracts me to this field. I like the mix of the politics and the, the law. And I think it's one of the great challenges we have is to navigate that, um, uh, that landscape where politics and law are intertwined and it requires Uh, both of them. I don't want to get the politics out of the international law. I just want to get the good politics into the international law. So I too, like others, I because of the lockdown, I haven't had a chance to um, get the book and study it, but I'll get to it and I'm looking forward to reading it. And uh, I'm sure it's a wonderful contribution. Congratulations, Elvira. Thank you very much, Bill. So colleagues, we have a few minutes left still and there's a there was a question from um, There was a question from Amal, but I'm not sure, Amal, we might get to it. There's a few other comments there. I also want to reflect two other legends, really, of the human rights world who wanted to be with us but couldn't. Christine Chinkin sends her congratulations. She's uh, looking forward to reading the book as well. And of course, you might know Christine Chinkin, another trailblazer in terms of her contribution to human rights. And uh, I think Elvira sees her as a, a path blazer also who created the voice for, for this kind of work. And the other is Francoise Hampson who was hoping to join us as well, and might still, uh, depending on how long we go, but uh, Francoise also sends her congratulations. And I think Elvira, you owe a lot of copies of books to lots of people. So I hope you've got deep pockets on that one. Uh, Phil wants to know what the next book is. Um, Ruth Juliet congratulates you and says one of your former students from Middlesex, now a lecturer herself in Kenya, and she enjoys making reference to your literature on special mechanisms. And she says, thank you for keeping us Enlighten. Hassan, you want to raise some questions to the panelists? I'm afraid I'm not sure we can have very much time for this. And uh, Janji, you, you, you want to congratulate Elvira once again, and you also want a copy of the book. Um, yes, absolutely. But Francoise, I understand, has just arrived, according to Christiana. Francoise, is that, uh, Francoise, are you with us? Yes. Fabulous. Just in time. Just when I talked about your credentials as a trailblazer and how you might be elsewhere. But you I might be fabulous to have you here. Please, over to you. Thanks. Um, first of all, congratulations, Elvira. I think the I get frustrated by traditional human rights lawyers because they have the feeling of so many lawyers which thinks that all the sexy bits happen in litigation. And they are always looking to do the cutting edge thing. They don't waste their time as they see it, looking at the preliminary steps like admissibility conditions. They dive in to what they see as the key issue. For a very long time, I thought one of the most neglected areas is the non-treaty body area of human rights law. If you look at what the special procedures have delivered in the way of uh, exploring the concepts of certain norms, which are then picked up by the treaty bodies, or if you look at what they've done on country visits to actually shift what states do, I think it's, uh, it's this, this is... It's been, we've been waiting for 30 odd years for a book on the special procedures. I think the notion of politicization could usefully be unpacked, and I'm looking forward to reading it like the others, I've not read the book yet, to see how you're unpacking it. Because 
as a member of the subcommission, I saw human rights law being used basically as a battering ram for political purposes, and that was not helpful. Um, I also saw the shift round about 1999, where some states began to realize that particularly European states were talking human rights and they were accepting that a court could judge their own behavior. In other words, they weren't simply using it for political purposes. And that was beginning to register before 9-11. But I think there is a, another sense, it's, you get an echo of this in French where politique also means policy. And I think looking at policy, if you like, de lege ferenda is one of the key roles of special procedures. And that ties in with what Phil said about the Committee of Ministers. I think one of the strengths of the Strasbourg system, I didn't think like this when I was in my 20s, I was appalled that there should be political interference in a judicial process. But if you compare the Strasbourg system for trying to get general measures and the inter-American system, the fact that there is a body that's composed of the representatives of states, which is playing a different role when they're looking at implementation of judgments, and they've got very much better than they used to be. But that actually gives clout to uh, the judgments of the court. They would have less clout without that role of the Committee of Ministers. So I think that Bill was right in saying that you need to look at both. But I think one's got to distinguish a, a, a non-legal or a non-judicial role from simply using human rights as a battering ram. And I was surprised, Joshua, to hear you say to Kathleen that she needs to take European influence to the United States. I think we could do with some European influence here in the United Kingdom. <laughs> and congratulations again, Elvira. Look forward to seeing you soon. Well said, well said, Francoise, absolutely. We don't, we don't seem to have a government at the moment, so. <laughs> oh, if only. <laughs> Absolutely. Colleagues, thank you very much for, for all this participation. It's been um, long and uh, many other messages coming through, but I, I, want, I don't want to end without going back to Elvira to acknowledge some of the, the comments. I don't know how you're going to do it, but good luck. I mean, one of the things we do know is you owe a lot of people, a lot of books, so I hope you're, <laughs> hope you're ready for that. Over to you, Elvira. I'm a bit overwhelmed and I cannot even unmute myself. Um, um, I'm almost happy you cannot be with me right now. It's a bit shaky. I didn't expect um, all this. Um, I think I'm going to spend a couple of days translating it to Spanish and sending it to my mother so <laughs> she can cry on my behalf. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted just to acknowledge a mal question about whether I um, agree there's a historical bias towards appointing academics as special rapporteurs, and whether or not it's important to preserve their independence. And these are big questions that I also try to address in the book. Basically, I don't think there is a particular bias to appoint academics. I think there are many circumstances that make academics more suitable to take time off and to still be paid by their institution, at least some institutions from some countries, and to be able to perform a job that requires you small things, like a single human being like Magdalena uh, reporting and researching on extreme poverty worldwide. I mean, there's, there's not every job that allows you to do that. Um, I think also academics bring their own problems. They understand independence as academic freedom which is not. Um, so they think they can just say whatever they want because they are the experts. And that's not what being an expert means when you're talking on behalf of victims and you have the stamp of the United Nations. So I actually think academics bring their own baggage. That's not, but everybody brings their own baggage. And I guess that needs to be acknowledged, but absolutely independence from political interference has to be a name Experts need to monitor states. States need to have some accountability system to, to, to see what's happening and to get informed by experts. Um, but it's with the special procedures, it's particularly difficult because they are navigating constantly both worlds. And um, that makes them unique, that makes them politicized, even if some of them will probably scream if they hear me saying this. Um, but that's, they, they have to combine all kinds of, 
of skills and, and they are a good reflection on how both worlds interact constantly, um, which can be hidden in other areas better than in as a special rapporteur. Um, I think Colin is gone, but I mean, he has thanked me for a contribution to this case on torture. It was one of the craziest things I have ever witnessed being in a court in Delhi, trying to um, convince a court that the government had to ratify the Convention Against Torture because they had made a promise at the international level. Um, it didn't work, but it was super fun. So it's me who has to be grateful for many, many opportunities I've had. I don't want to finish, and I want to finish. So thank you, thanking everybody again. Christiana, who is there hiding behind the Middlesex logo, who has organized all this, and I know and many other things she has been handling, personal and professional, thank you very much. And obviously, Joshua for sharing today. I mean, we have been working together and researching together and sharing professional projects for a very, very long time now. You have been the first reader of my book. And as you know, I'm very, very grateful for many perspectives that you have given me through the years and on the book too. You also know we don't agree many, many times. But thank you for organizing this too, for all these people you brought in. Um, that's it. I hope we can all meet very soon. And I promise to be uh, saving all the money on wine for books. <laughs> thank you very much. And of course, I don't know if Alston, uh, Meryl Alston, who is the editor who has helped me so much uh, over these past two years, is there still listening? But if she is anyway, thank you to her and to Oxford University Press. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elvira. Hassan had a question about the Middle East as well and, and UN special mechanisms. And I think it's a, it probably is a very, very good and pertinent question. But I'm, I'm afraid I, we were supposed to finish at 7 and it's now 7.25. I very happily thought that we could go till 7.30, but I realized that this might be a bit too long. But thank you very much. It's, uh, it's been fascinating listening to all of you. And, you know, just one, one message from me, if you, if you permit me. There is at the moment this sense of doom and gloom but it's also an engineered doom and gloom. There are incredible, incredible green shoots of recovery that are taking place in many, many parts of the world, but we don't hear about it because we don't have a free press. And so we, don't, we, we basically have these green shoots occurring in many places, and these green shoots are people standing up for rights against huge odds. We don't hear about these stories, and as a result, we just see the barren desert. But actually, the greening of the desert is on, and it's happening, and there's a call for it. We need less of the soul searching and less admiration and, and depression about the desert and more focus on nurturing the green shoots so that we can link them up to really regreen that desert. And human rights is a key tool in this particular battle. Uh, the, the incredible people who've been on this call uh, are testament to the work that they've done. Uh, Elvira, the book I hope will take off. I hope it will respond to many of the critiques that have been framed by people who may have been very smart but probably ill-informed Ill on the strategy of how to progress human rights. I think some of the critiques offered were there to improve human rights, but they've backfired. They've been used instead by populists to undermine the name of human rights with, with populations who should know better. And so you have this strange nexus between the 1% millionaires and the vast dispossessed. And the human rights, the one tool that could help it, is being thrashed. So it's great to see a book that restores faith in human rights. And to be on this call with so many of you who've taken so many incredible steps towards that re-greening. Thank you very much for it and go in solidarity. Good night and good afternoon and good morning. Cheers. Thanks, Christiana.